Let's pray. Let's pray and get ready for the Word of God and what God wants to share with us. Dear Lord, we thank you for your grace and your favor upon our lives. As I share this morning, I pray that your Holy Spirit will cut us deep into our hearts, transform our lives. Lord, we thank you and we submit to your Lordship. It's all about you, Lord. May your name be glorified this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Right, this Friday, I was in my Friday morning men's victory group, and we were discussing so many different things about how do we stand strong as believers in a crooked world? How do we stand for righteousness when everybody else seems to want to take a shortcut? How can we be men of the word? And as we were sharing, so many guys were sharing such deep insights as well. I was so, so encouraged. And when I walked away, I thought to myself, wow, God, you are moving. You are moving. Your word is relevant to us. Your spirit wants to transform us. And I believe God is busy knitting us all together, getting us ready for the call that he has in store for us. So are you guys ready to persevere with great zeal? Amen? Ready to persevere with great zeal and honor God. So we continue on our series, Second Timothy, impart truth, stay the course. Imparting truth, staying the course. And last week, Paul introduces for the first time the concept of false teachers and Christians that are bickering about non-issues and getting their eyes taken off the ball. And what we had learned is when we focus on Jesus and the gospel and the call of God upon our lives, we don't get sidetracked by false teaching and misdirection. We are focused on the main thing. And we focused last week quite on a few things that, you know, some of the false teachings and things that we have to deal with today in the modern world and how we can stand strong in those. I really want to encourage you, go back and listen to that message because, in fact, when you look at the text that we are doing, it's all actually one sermon. So go check out that sermon because it's going to give you a lot of context for today's message. Now, this morning, we're going to be focusing on our hearts. And how, as believers, our hearts need to be ready as we deal with people that oppose you, that hurt you, and sometimes people that persecute you. How can we deal with these people in a godly way? How can we bring the gospel? How can we be Christians that make sure that Jesus is at the center? It's not about us. It's not about our suffering. It's about him and about his call. How can we get our hearts ready for that. Now, I'm going to share a little quick story. Now, growing up, I grew up in a really fantastic home. My parents both loved each other, and they loved us, and um, my sister and I just grew up in an incredibly secure environment of love and nurture, and I remember, you know, my dad was very successful in the corporate world as well, so we didn't want for anything. Any, you know, we, we were well-fed, we were well-clothed, we, we lived in Umschlanga Ridge, where everybody wanted to live in those days, you know, so we had the privilege of growing up in Umschlanga Ridge, and so as you can tell, I was a little bit suburban soft. And so this suburban soft boy, you know, I, I was about 12 years old, my parents were away, they were abroad, and I was sleeping over at a friend's house, and we were playing an under-13 rugby match at the Bluff. Now, how many of you know the Bluff in Durban? The Bluff. How many of you come from the Bluff? Anybody here from the Bluff? No, no, no not that, so, so, you're also from Umschlanga, I know that. Right, so there was this old saying, rough and tough and from the Bluff. Okay, it doesn't mean that everybody from the bluff was rough and tough, but let me tell you, there were a lot more tough people there than in my neighborhood, I can tell you that. And so as we drove in the bus towards the school, it was this little Afrikaans school that we were playing against, and as you looked around, you realized, we're not in the Mschlange anymore, my friend. We're not in the Mschlange anymore. Park the bus, get out. Now, there was this one kid who was known in the end of the opposition team, he was known to be big, aggressive, scary, and he wanted to make sure that he was going to welcome all of us. 
so nicely to the bluff. In fact, his father used to say the most awful things next to the field to the opposition players, and sometimes even awful things to his own son while we were playing, and we knew that because we played against him every single year. And so as we got off the bus, I saw him, and I'm going to call him Yanni, just for the sake that I don't um, embarrass anyone, but when we saw Yanni on the opposite side of the field, I looked at him and I thought, my goodness, he's grown over the last year. And he's looking scarier than ever. The game started, and Yanni was running down the touchline, and I tackled him out the touchline. I was playing fullback. Tackled him out the touchline. And, you know, in that school, what the, there was this culture that the parents and the spectators stood really, really close to the touchlines. So that when you go out, you are right in the middle of the spectators, and some of the ladies with the umbrellas will tap you with an umbrella just to make sure that you also feel welcome, welcome to the bluff today. And as I stood up, I heard his father say to him, you better get him. You better get him because of the embarrassment that he had tackled you out the touchline. And it wasn't long after that I was in, the, in a, you know, lying at the bottom of a ruck, and suddenly there was this arm that slithered around my neck and took a grip, and I, and I realized it's Yanni breathing heavily here behind me, holding me tight, and he started to choke me. He choked me so hard. He was so big and so strong and choked me so hard I couldn't breathe. And eventually the game continued, the referee didn't see, and it's just the two of us. I'm lying on top of the guy, he's got my back, and he's choking the life out of me. And I'm looking for some support. I'm looking at all the parents, because my parents weren't there. I'm looking at all the parents next to the field, and I'm thinking, where's someone needs to help me here? Someone needs to help me. And I'm looking at them, and they are shouting, yes, yes. I'm thinking to myself, is this it? Is this how I go? I mean, listen, it was probably only a few moments, but for me it felt like an eternity, and I'm thinking, you know, I didn't think it was going to end like this. I was going to, I was going to die from a chocolate overdose. That was my destiny. In Schlanger, for heaven's sake, not here. And just as I'm about to hand myself over to mercy... Yanni leaves me and then runs off to go and join the rest of the rugby match. And I have to admit, it changed my view of humanity. I was traumatized. I mean, I always thought everybody's awesome and people are so nice. And I mean, we are the world. You know, like I, I had this rosy view of humankind and it was shattered forever. I mean, what kind of a monster would do that? What kind of a person we try and choke somebody else to the near point of death. But as time got on, went on, we started to hear the stories of Yanni's father who used to beat him every single day. Every single day. He used to beat him for not winning, beat him for not being good enough. And when his father would get intoxicated, he would beat him even more. And so this young man not realizing, you know, as I got older, I started to realize that even though what he did to me was wrong, ultimately, this guy was fighting his own demons. And I started to get compassion for this guy. And you know what? There are many people in our lives that might hurt us. And sometimes they do it out of their own deception without even realizing the hurt that they inflict on others. So I'm going to turn to our passage today, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20, and it reads as follows. Now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. 
and along with those who call on the name of the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, and patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Now, this morning, for some of you, you're going to resonate with the first part of the passage, and you're going to be like, yes, I want to be set apart as holy. I want to be used for God. I want to be used for His kingdom. Lord, cleanse me, set me apart. For others of you, you're going to resonate with the practical part. Ah, now I know how I can deal with opponents of the gospel. Now I know how I can deal with people that might persecute you, people that might hurt you. But then there's also a group of people here today, and I believe that this message today is going to give you a different perspective of how you can deal with the hurt that you've experienced in your life, how you can be set free, how you can learn to forgive, and how you can be a light even to the people that's hurt you. Right, so we're going to look at verse 20, and we're going to, you know, uh, uncover it a bit, but before I get to that, I want to say this. We, we, we are going to leave you with a big picture experience here today, and you're going to learn this. The Holy Spirit empowers us to have pure hearts, enabling us to engage graciously and redemptively with those who hurt us out of their own deception. Okay? The Holy Spirit empowers you and me to have pure hearts, enabling us to engage graciously and redemptively with those who hurt us sometimes out of their own deception. Are you guys ready to learn today? Let's look at verse 20. Now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Now the context of this specific passage really speaks again to last week's sermon about false teachers and quarreling and how we should not be engaging in those things. We need to be honorably used by God, and that does not honor God. Now, the language that's being used is Paul is echoing rabbinical discussions on clean utensils and dishonorable utensils or, or uh, that which is not clean, unclean utensils in the kitchen, in the home. But it's not speaking about things. It's speaking about you and me. It's speaking about people. Those that are walking honorable lives who are ready to be ready for honorable work and those that live dishonorable lives and they are doing dishonorable work. Where do you find yourself today? Where do you find yourself today? And so Paul gives us this allegory, and it says, listen, watch out. Don't get sucked into false teaching. Don't listen to that. Don't be a false teacher yourself. Secondly, don't quarrel and bicker about little things and small things. It takes you away from the big picture, but it's not only about false teaching. It's actually also about the moral imperative, which is, are we living holy lives? Are we saying, God, I want to cleanse myself from anything that doesn't honor you. In fact, in our church and in our denomination, we have a saying or the, you know, one of the, the main things that we say, we, we exist to honor God. That's the very first sentence of our mission statement. We exist to honor God. Therefore, anything that falls outside the honor of God, we want to get rid of because we want to live for him. Does your life honor God? Every decision that we make, does it honor God? And maybe it's not a bad thing when you wake up in the morning to say, Lord, I want to honor you. And throughout the day, you need to ask yourself when we get those decisions that we have to make every day, when your temper starts to flare, how many of you experienced that this week? God, does this honor you? Or does this dishonor you? I want to honor you. 
I want to live for you. So Paul sets us apart and he says, listen, there's a trio of things, three things that happens when we set ourselves, you know, when we cleanse ourselves from these things. Three things. Number one, you get set apart as holy. You get set apart as holy. Meaning we become more like Jesus every day. Lord, whatever doesn't honor you, I want to I wanna honor you. I'm going to set that aside. And it says we are set apart for a call. Being holy means being set apart. It means that you are not the same as everybody else. You are somebody that's conforming more and more to what Jesus says in his words. It's a growing holiness in your life, being set apart. How many of you want to live ultimately the call that God has for you? How many of you want to live like that? I want to live like that. I want to live like that. But that means we need to be set apart as holy. And I know I've said this before, but one of my favorite songs when I was a student at university, I'd never heard the song before, and um, it was Refiner's Fire. My heart's one desire is to be holy, set apart to do your will. And the first time I heard that song, they made a call and they said, those of you that want to set yourself apart and allow the Holy Spirit to make you holy, come to the front. And I went to the front. My life was never the same ever again. The refining fire of the Lord that comes and burns in our hearts and burns away all the impurities to say, God, we want to live holy lives set apart for you. doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect, but there's this growing holiness and a desire to be set apart. One of the hallmarks of a growing Christian is not perfection, but when we step out of line, the conviction of God comes and we say, Lord, no more, I want to follow you. It's one of the hallmarks of a new believer that is honoring God. The second thing, we become useful to the master of the house. We become useful. How many of you want to be useful for God? Now, when my little girls were younger, I mean, they were very cute. They were fantastic, but they messed a lot. And they were a lot of hard work. How many of you have got little babies right here? How many of you know that when you're in that season, church gets tough, doesn't it? You know, you're running after kids all the time. It's not easy. And I remember, man, they were cute, but they were not quite useful other than looking at. (laughs) But as they matured, and as they are maturing, every now and then I might get my own cup of coffee given to me. That the plates disappear by themselves into the dishwasher. Every now and then it's true that there needs to be some coaxing to help them to do it. But ultimately, they have become more useful to the household. Amen? And when we become mature in the Lord, when we start to grow, when we become more like Jesus, something starts to happen. We are able to walk in usefulness towards God's kingdom. That's why becoming mature as a believer is important. There is nothing worse than if you were 30 years old and your mother still feeds you. It's cute when they're three years old. It is not cute when they are 30. When we become believers, yes, we are born again, infants in Christ. But surely as we mature, we are now going to start to graduate into the useful things that God has in store for us. It's no longer about me and my growth. It's about, Lord, your kingdom. Show me where I fit in. We become useful for the master. How many of you want to be useful? I want to be useful. And then the third thing is we are ready for every good work ready to go out and do the works that God has called us to do. As I grow and as I mature, what I find is I feel more equipped and I'm ready. Equipped and ready. When we allow equipping to take place, we are ready for any good work. Right. How many of you are ready to cleanse yourself from that which is dishonorable and say, God, use me. Use me. But Paul takes it further. Verse 22, so flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Now, I love the contrast that Paul uses here. 
he says, you are going to flee from certain things. And then you're going to pursue something else. You're going to discard this, but you are going to grab on and embrace this. This is going to destroy your life, and this is going to give you life. Now, why is this important? Many believers think that the Christian life is about, oh, I need to flee from the devil. Oh, the devil's bad. He's bad. I need to flee. Flee from all this. And flee. Yes, and that's maybe one part of the, of the walk. But probably the more important part is we flee from here, but we hold on to God. We hold on to Him. Now, what's Paul saying to Timothy? He's saying, first of all, flee from the passions of youth. Now, why? Well, what are the passions of youth in the Greco-Roman world, even the Jewish world? Very often, you know, when they spoke about the passions of youth, they spoke about woman and song and woman and wine, you know, all that type of stuff that many young people will then engage in. And I don't think it's outside of the scope that Paul is, in fact, speaking to Timothy, saying, listen, you're still a young man. Watch out that you don't get taken down the wrong path here because you are a servant of the Lord. Now, marriage is awesome. Yes, but at the same time, we need to make sure in our engagement with the opposite sex as young people that we make sure it is holy, regardless of who you are, especially here in South Africa. I digress now. This wasn't planned. But in South Africa, we see just a growing licentiousness when it comes to, um, when it comes to the subject of sex. And how can we as young people, Christian young people today, show what the standard of God looks like and show where the blessing of God resides. That's important. He says, flee from youthful passions. But it's not only that. When you think of youthful passions, I think it's got a lot to do also with hot-headedness. I mean, when you were younger, you were a lot more hot-headed, impatient, ready to go out and do great things. And yes, it was a, a, a great way to go out and explore the world, but there comes a time when we need to realize this, that if we engage in a world that is anti-Christ, anti-God, against that which we believe, we need wisdom in how we are going to deal with these people in love. We need to watch out for hot-headedness. We need to watch out for that. So he says, leave hot-headedness and your flesh behind. Flee from that and then pursue what? He says, pursue um, righteousness, peace, love, and a pure heart. What is this? These are the marks of a mature believer. The marks of an immature believer, the hot-headedness, the running after sin, the lack of wisdom. But those who start to mature in the Lord, we leave that behind, righteousness, love, peace, pure heart. How many of you want to grab onto that? Now, why is Paul speaking about this? Because actually, he is busy setting up Timothy and us to deal with people that bring the worst out of you. How many of you know that person that brings the worst, worst out of you? We call them the stone in your shoe. And like I said, if you don't have someone in mind, maybe someone's got you in mind. Why is Paul speaking about this? Because ultimately, we need to cleanse our hearts, say, Lord, not my will, your will be done. Lord, I want to be set apart as holy. Lord, I want to grow and mature in you. Why? Because when I get into the battlefield of opposition, where there are human beings that do not like what you stand for or just want to hurt you for the sake of hurting you, you're going to know how to deal with them in a godly, uplifting, winsome way, and your very enemy might end up becoming a convert of Jesus Christ. Now let's look at this. Verse 23. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies, you know that they breed quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. Now notice this. Notice the sweet spirit that Paul is saying Timothy needs to act in. Right in the middle of the battle where you've got people that persecute you, 
people that want nothing to do with Christianity, people that bring false teaching, people that just hurt you for the sake of hurting you, people that glorify sin, saying all of you need to partake in this. How do we deal with this when this happens as believers? Right there in that battlefield. And Paul says to him, listen, Timothy, you need to deal with these people with gentleness and kindness with the opposite spirit. We're going to get to that now. Notice there's no hot-headedness here. How many of you, when you are wrong, do you want to say, mm, mm, I'm, going to, I'm going to show that person? Eh? Like the stuff that you see on reality TV. I'm going to cut them off. No hot-headedness here. There is no flesh here. You notice that? It's not about Timothy. It's about the people. How can we win these people, even when they come against you? What I see here is only the fruit of the Holy Spirit, not the flesh. The fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, self-control. That's one we don't preach on very often anymore. The fact that the Lord has called us to exercise self-control. One of the great hallmarks of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And make no mistake, Paul is not saying to Timothy, be a pushover. Not at all. He's saying to Timothy, correct and teach. Still bringing truth. Some people get this wrong. They think by being gentle and kind means we never speak truth. We speak truth because it sets people free. We speak truth. But it's about the spirit in which we speak it. One of the saddest things that I see sometimes as Christians in the media, how they react to their opponents, and even though they might win the argument, they lose the war. Because when people look at them, they are so put off by their way and the spirit in which they act. There's a very big difference between bringing truth and bringing it in the right spirit, not only winning the battle, but we actually win the war because we are winning people. Am I winning people? Am I winning people here? Now, that's what I speak about when I say coming in the opposite spirit. Remember, the enemy wants to destroy you and he wants to destroy the people that come against you, both. We need to realize it's the spirit behind them that is acting. The Lord, uh, Paul tells us in Ephesians, it's not against flesh and blood that our war is, but against the powers and the principalities of evil. What is happening behind that person that's bringing the push? We're not fighting flesh and blood. We are fighting the enemy. So we need to come in the opposite spirit, the spirit of holiness, the spirit of love. It's the opposite spirit. You know, Binks and I often see it in marriage counseling. And, you know, you have couples fighting and very often you find that the conflict is not redemptive. It is actually just to win the argument. And in the end, you might win the argument, but you're going to lose the war to save your marriage. It's not about you. It's about the redemptive nature of making sure that we win the other person that becomes important. In the same way, if we make ourselves ready for God's honorable use, it means less of me and more of him. Less of my desire, more of his desire. And when we open up the heart of God, what you're going to hear is people, 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 people. God loves people, especially those people that are your enemies. How many of you sometimes pray this like, Lord, crush them? <laughs> You know that person that comes against you in some way? Lord, if you had to just come like the Old Testament and smote them and take them away and remove them from our life. But the Lord loves that guy too. And sometimes maybe he placed that stone in your shoe so that you can grow and so that his glory can be manifest in you. And even someone that's an enemy can be saved. 
Now, why is this? Now, watch this. Watch this. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. The heart of the believer is to win the person. Notice that. It's to win the person. We are there in gentleness and kindness, sharing truth. Why? So that they can come to repentance because something has happened in their life. Sometimes, as believers, you become the punching bag for other people who are actually dealing with their own issues. Binks and I have seen that so often, haven't we? You become the face of everything that they hate because it reminds them of where they should be and the stuff that they are dealing with and the anger gets directed towards you. Don't take it personally. It's the spirit fighting against the spirit in you. Now, why is this? It says that they have been captured by the enemy to do his will unknowingly. And when I think back of Yanni and that choking incident, here was a young man in his formative years who had been captured by the enemy because of his own trauma and then enacted that act of violence. So my job is how can we allow this guy to see Jesus so that he can be set free? Now, there's two passages here. The first one is, come to their senses. The Greek actually translates that, coming into soberness. When someone's been captured by the enemy, they've been intoxicated. And those of you who have ever seen someone who's drank too much or on drugs, they are not of the right mind. They cannot make good decisions. Why? They have been intoxicated. And what is important here is we need to help people to come out of that intoxication and into soberness by the power of the Holy Spirit. The second one is capture. That word is the Greek word sorgeo, which means to catch alive. They've been caught alive and placed into bondage. And so even though they are still alive, they are actually walking in the chains of their own shame and their own trauma and their own sin and their own false teaching that they've received. And here they are in those chains. And the Lord says, when you deal with them and you bring them truth and you do it in a way that the Spirit leads with gentleness and kindness, you might find that they come to repentance and they're going to be set free from the enemy and no longer doing his will unknowingly. That's powerful. That is powerful. Now let me close with this. What is Paul saying here ultimately? He's saying let's pursue God together. Get rid of that which is dishonorable. Hold on to that which is honorable. Be set apart as holy so that you can be used in a world that is becoming more and more antagonistic towards the gospel more and more antagonistic towards the values of the Christian faith. As we stand up, don't take it personally when people say the most awful things about you. You come in the opposite spirit. Why? So that we can see people changed and saved. And if we do that as a church, let me tell you, you're going to turn the world upside down. You're going to turn the world upside down. I'm going to read that catchphrase again. The Holy Spirit empowers us to have pure hearts, enabling us to engage graciously and redemptively with those who hurt us out of their own deception. So I've shared with you now the kind of the call that we have as a church. But I think the Lord also wants to deal with many people's hearts this morning. Because I know there are people here and you know that you're in captivity. And you might be doing the devil's will, maybe first unknowingly, and now maybe as I've been preaching, you're like, oh my goodness, maybe I've not been living my life the right way. Now, what captures us? Very often it's sin and shame. When sin and shame comes, sin starts to have its hold on us. 
shame enters and we don't believe that God is able to forgive us and love us and we go in this downward spiral and you get captured more and more. For other people, it is false teaching. Maybe you've been engaging in um, ancestral worship. Maybe you've been engaging in witchcraft. Maybe you've been engaging in different faiths. And ultimately, they will keep you in bondage because there's only one God. His name is Jesus Christ, the only one who died on the cross and was raised from the dead, destroying the works of the enemy. And he says, today, I can bring you freedom and set you free. And you'll have eternal life with me forever. What else captures us? And I think this is maybe something that many of you might experience. The hurt of trauma when people hurt you, maybe in your most formative years, when you were young in your home, or maybe recently, maybe in a marriage that fell apart, maybe things that had happened in your life, even right now, and that hurt has turned into bitterness, and that bitterness has made your hard heart, your heart hard, and you are struggling to see Jesus. And the Lord wants to set you free today. And he wants to say, listen, if you've been captured like that, come to me. Firstly, I'm going to wash you clean. I'm going to heal you. Then I'm going to enable you to forgive all of those that hurt you. I'm going to open up your eyes to see their own trauma. And suddenly, even the hurt that they engaged on you, you're going to say, Lord, I've got empathy for them because I can see where they're coming from. I can see their hurt. It helps you to also be set free. Doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be reconciled to that person. Because maybe what they did was wrong. Reconciliation takes two people, repentance from both and reconciliation from both. If the other person is still abusive, still there, you can forgive and you can love them and give truth to them. But it doesn't mean that you're going to be best mates forever. Sometimes there's a necessary ending where you need to move on. However, may you and me be set free today. Lord, take away that which is dishonorable. I'm going to leave unforgiveness behind, sin, shame, false teaching, and I'm going to move towards and pursue that which you have for me. And that's where the Lord sets us free.